And what is your name? I'm Spencer Pelton. McKenna. So my name is Mark Cervantes. My name is Gerardo Garcia. My name is Amy Clark. I'm Richard Currett. I'm Doug Samuelson. And I'm the owner, along with my wife, of uh, Warren Ranch Company that owns this property. I'm Todd Cervell. I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of Wyoming. When I was a kid, I used to play with dinosaur toys, pretending to be one of them. I was absolutely fascinated by the idea that there were these giant, bus-sized, lizard-like animals that walked on the ground on which I now walked. My parents bought book after book that described in detail the various characteristics of each dinosaur species. Pictures abound of actual bones, fossils of these mighty animals. Bones that have gone through a hundred million years of decay. My backyard became pockmarked with holes that I dug, dozens of them, looking for dinosaur fossils. Once I decided to dig a hole so deep that I'd reach the center of the earth. I remember my parents yelling at me to stop digging holes because they became tripping hazards. but my imagination got the better of me. I wanted to be a dinosaur scientist. Then life happened and I became a musician instead and a video producer and a dad. Yet the fantasy never died. So in the summer of 2022, I got the opportunity to visit Todd Surville, an archeologist with the University of Wyoming. I packed up, jumped in the car, and drove with my family through multiple states for what seemed an endless four to five days. On our way there, we almost hit a deer watching it cross the median on the opposite side into heavy traffic where there were semi-trucks and other vehicles traveling 80 miles an hour. I was impressed with its flexibility and acrobatics, but I digress. Fast forward to the dig site and there they were. Mammoth bones in the ground. Now I realize that these aren't dinosaur bones, but still my fascination with the whole study of dinosaurs and, and ancient animals got the better of me and I had to take a look. At first I gingerly walked over as I saw the researchers digging into the ground and revealing more and more of the bones. I wanted to touch them but in my mind I thought what would these researchers say if I bent down and touched one, right? I didn't want to get yelled at, right? I didn't want to mess up their research by putting my, my mark, so to speak, on the bones. But they were nonchalant and they said, yeah, go right ahead, touch them. And when I touched them, it was interesting because it was almost almost like this, like smooth yet bumpy at the same time, right? It, it felt like dry bones and it was amazing. The bones were kind of rough, bumpy sometimes. There were lots of holes in them. And it, it, it was just an incredible, incredible experience being able to be right there touching them 
And of course, they wanted me to be careful as I stepped around the bones. Like, let's pretend these dinosaurs were the bones. Like, I would have to carefully step into here and then step here and then step over here. Uh, so, because they didn't want me to mess up their dig site, obviously, but they still allowed me to walk amongst them and film them. And it was an exciting, incredible experience. Then I wondered, how did they know the bones were there in the first place? How did they know to search right in that specific plot of land. I mean, we're talking about acres and acres, miles, dozens of miles of Wyoming desert. And here in the middle of nowhere, they got the bones. How did they do that? Now this is private land, so I can't tell you where it is, but I can tell you the story of how they got to these bones. Enter an immigrant from Chile, which, by the way, is my mother's home country. My name is Gerardo Garcia. And, uh, well, I was doing uh, water installation, so I was trenching. And when I was filling up the trench, I found a, a round bone rolling in front of my back. So that's how kind of strange to see that big, big bone. So I knew there was something different, so. That's how we got him. All these deals started, you know. Spencer Pelton, Wyoming State archaeologist, elaborates. Uh, right now we're excavating what looks to be an articulated mammoth buried about a meter and a half deep on the Warren Livestock Ranch. Uh, about a year and a half ago, a uh, heavy machinery operator named Gerardo, who's up here at the screens, uh, he was digging this trench coming right right through here to uh, make some water improvements for livestock. Uh, in the process, he hit uh, some big bone. He actually hit this piece right here. And uh, noticed that it might be something somebody else might want to take a look at. This is the, the head of a mammoth femur, this piece right here on the hips. Um, a few months later, the landowner, Doug Sanderson, reached out to Todd Suravel, the department head, or former department head at the University of Wyoming and uh, told him about this mammoth and Todd said, I'll be out there the next day. So came out and they opened this trench back up and um, cleaned the profile up of the trench and saw mammoth bones sticking out of the wall of it down here where people are digging. Uh, a little bit later, submitted some of that bone for radiocarbon dating to figure out how old it was. Uh, and it turned out to be about 13,100 years old. So well within the range of um, top potential human involvement with the site. Uh, so when we find something like that, we want to know, obviously, did people kill this mammoth or what did it die of natural causes? Uh, if it is an archaeological site and people are involved with this, it would be you know, among no more than 16, 17 sites in the New World where we have evidence of people hunting mammoths. So it would be a really important thing. So that's why we're here instead of a paleontology, paleontological team, is we want to figure out if people were involved with this site or not. Uh, so to do that, we're excavating this really carefully, uh, screening for really tiny artifacts uh, to see if there's any evidence that people actually killed this mammoth and, and butchered it with stone tools around you know, 13,000 years ago. And have you found any stone tools? We found one possible flake. Um, flakes are the byproducts of stone tool production. So you go into butchering a mammoth with stone tools, you, your knife dulls. You got to resharpen it by knocking little pieces of chert or quartzite off. Uh, and we have one little piece of stone that might be evidence of, of that activity, of somebody resharpening a stone tool. But nothing super definitive yet. Um, but we're still pretty early in this. This is only day uh, day four. So there's still, still a good chance that we'll, we'll turn up something. A possible stone tool next to mammoth bones? This was a potentially history-making find. Even if the researchers cannot confirm a human presence, the bones can still tell us a lot about how mammoths went extinct. Todd Suravelt explains. 
Does this dig site have anything to do with your your research on uh, on the arrival of humans? Well, that's the first question we're trying to answer. Is is this a paleontological site, meaning that this is a mammoth that died a natural death and had nothing to do with people, or is this a mammoth that that humans killed? Um, and it dates to the time period of human arrival to the to this part of the continent. Um, so it's possible that humans okay. killed it, and we found a few indications of uh, that, uh, of humans here. Nothing, nothing, a hundred percent definitive yet. Um, another interesting thing about about mammoths, of course, is that they don't exist anymore, right? So, the extinction of mammoths occurs only a few hundred years after humans arrive on the continent. And, um, we have pretty good evidence for humans interacting with and in, uh, killing these animals. Yeah. Um, although these sites are fairly rare. So this site could potentially speak to the, the cause of, of mammoth extinction as well. So don't they say uh, humans might have caused their extinction? Yeah, there, there are a number of, of ideas about um, what, what factor or factors caused the extinction of the mammoths and a, and a lot of other large animals that were here at the time as well, like horses and Nine, camels, four, giant ground slugs. Um, the idea that humans did it is what we call the overkill hypothesis, that it was primarily driven by human predation. But this is also a time of dramatic climatic change and environmental change. Uh, and some people think that was the main driver of extinction. Some people have proposed that um, humans, the arrival of humans indirectly caused the extinction by introducing novel pathogens, diseases that these animals had never experienced. So there's a number of a number of ideas that are being considered. Um, I tend to to favor the idea that humans were the primary primary driver of the extinction event. It's it's interesting if you look at, at mammoths of this age in Wyoming. Um, about 40 or 50 percent of them that we found are associated with with artifacts. And, and if that's a reliable number, we're talking about very small numbers of mammoths, by the way, but if, that's, if that estimate is reliable, it means that at the end of the last ice age, um, a mammoth in Wyoming had a you know, 40 or 50% chance of dying at human hands, which is an incredible amount of mortality. Right. Mammoth populations can only sustain, I wanna say about, 3% mortality per year, or they'll go extinct. So 40% of them are dying in human hands. I mean, it's, there's really no denying that humans caused or at least drove the extinction event. But again, we're talking about very small samples, so it's still an open question. So there's no definitive proof of that? No definitive proof of a human-driven extinction? Yeah, not yet. Um, I would say the evidence is pretty strong, but in my discipline, it's actually one of the most highly debated questions there are. Different scientists look at the same evidence and interpret it in really different ways. Um, so for example, let's say that we found that this mammoth was killed by people. Um, does that mean we're looking at a common part of human life ways at the end of the last ice age in Wyoming? Or was this something that happened that some people would say a Clovis hunter might kill a mammoth once in their life and spend the rest of their life talking about it? Or was it something that happened weekly or monthly? And we really, we really don't know the answer to that. So whether this was a, you know, a major part of the subsistence strategy or a minor part remains debated. I think it's pretty clear this is, people spend a lot of time hunting big animals based on archaeological evidence but again there's a lot of debate about that it would be a huge food source yeah you know an adult mammoth an adult bull Colombian mammoth which is I'm pretty sure what we have here it's definitely an adult we're pretty sure it's a mammoth there's a small chance of a mastodon um, could weigh 10 tons so we're talking 20,000 pound animal and uh, it could probably feed 30 people for a month, be probably a million calories or more. So yeah, it's a lot of food. If mammoths weighed 20,000 pounds or 10 tons, that weighs more than a Ford Raptor F-150R and a Toyota Camry combined.
Wow. While the dick site featured mammoth bones, for me it became more than satisfying a childhood fantasy of digging for fossils. I learned a lot about the culture through the states in which I traveled. Many of the states I drove through are corn and cattle country. For hundreds of miles, I could see acres upon acres of cows raised on open fields right next to the highway. In other states, I could see acres and acres of corn. For many hundreds of miles, there are only two types of radio stations, country and Christian. It was downright predictable. Uh, once you got into urban areas, that's where you s heard a large variety of radio stations, be it pop music, we heard a lot of uh, Brazilian radio stations, um, uh, not just country, but also rap, uh, all kinds of music. But once we got about 20 to 30 miles outside of the major urban cities, what we heard was mostly country music and Christian music or also a lot of preachers preaching about the Bible. There were also some very common billboards along the highway. Uh, one of the most common was one that said, Jesus loves you. Another one was a pro-Trump message of some type. Key note, I'm not criticizing or advocating for any of these philosophies of thought. Uh, all I'm saying is, it taught me a lot about the people who lived there. And then since we traveled through cow country, there were flies everywhere. I mean, everywhere. It did, didn't matter where you stopped. You could stop in the middle of the highway to go to the bathroom, okay? There was a fly bothering your your space, invading your space. It, it was quite amazing how many flies were there. I didn't even know that many flies could exist, right? Let alone be flying around you. And it was so extreme to the point that there were flies in the restaurants where we had lunch and dinner. It got to the point where I had been very, very bothered by these flies. For some reason, the flies knew that I wasn't a native of that part of, of the country. And it, it's like I had a, a fly magnet on me and the flies would just come to me, right? And, and my family, not just me. And I would just be swiping them away. Meanwhile, we're in the middle of a restaurant, okay, with food on the table. In every other part of the country, that would be considered unhygienic. Uh, you could literally call a city inspector and they would close a restaurant down like that. For, that's how many flies were in the restaurant. And it got to be a problem such that I had even asked the waitress. I said, there are a lot of flies bothering us around here. Can you please like do something about the flies? <laughs> and you know what she said? <laughs> she, she gave me this like awkward look. She was like, uh, what do you want me to do about them? <laughs> I was just, I was flabbergasted in like a positive way. Like when she left, my wife and I just started laughing like crazy. Because here in Massachusetts, at least, if you ask a, a table server to do something about the flies, you know what I'm saying? They shoo it away and they kill it. Or they at least shoo it away outside the door. But, but this part of the country 
was saturated with so many flies that people who live out there just get used to it. <laughs> they, they actually tolerate the flies flying around their food. I literally looked, watched the food of a lot of the patrons around us and flies were literally walking on their food and the people didn't do anything. I mean, sometimes they did shoo them away, like especially when they were, went to grab a piece of bread or something and they wanted to start eating it. But there could be two or three flies on their food and nobody does anything about it. <laughs> That's my fly story. Anyway, I digress. This is cow country after all. So if you go to the cow country that is especially west of Indiana, um, even to some extent Ohio and Indiana, but especially like Nebraska, uh, those states out there, it's cow country and there are going to be a lot of flies and just expect it. Get used to it. Anyway, back to the mammoth bones. As I was watching them, their social interactions were interesting to observe. For instance, they were very egalitarian. There was a very clear hierarchy. In other words, you knew who was in charge, right? This guy Spencer and Todd were the main ones. There was another woman who was also in charge but they didn't really enforce it, right? They didn't get angry and yell at each other. They didn't get angry at the workers and, and start dictating, you do this, you do this. No, they just let everyone do their job. Like everyone knew they had a job to do and they did it. And that was quite amazing to me. Because uh, growing up, I had lots of jobs with a manager would just tell you what to do strictly to tell you what to do, right? It was more of a, a dominance thing for, for the managers. But in this case, in, in the Mammoth Dig, it, there was none of that. They were all friends. For instance, I knew from the beginning that Todd Suravel is the head honcho. He's, he's the reason this dig was even there. Okay, him and, and the, the Chilean who found the bones. Um, so Todd was the one managing everything. But let's see what he has to say about his role in the dig. What is your name and title? I'm Todd Suravel. I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of Wyoming. Okay, and what is your role here? Oh, I mostly clean the toilets and uh, <laughs> do whatever Spencer tells me to do. <laughs> Sorry, I have a hard time not being sarcastic. Oh, no problem. <laughs> I'm one of the archaeologists excavating this site. Are you the person who, who's kind of running this? It's a good question. I, I, I think this... <laughs> There's three of us running this project, myself and Sarah Alon and Spencer Pelton. They were there for a reason more important than themselves. The irony is that by learning about the mammoths, we might learn more about ourselves and our ancestors. When I first arrived at the dig site, they started to find some major bones. So far, we got exposed uh, probably a femur, that really big long bone right there. That's probably the leg bone of a mammoth. And then the kinna over here behind this bucket has the part of the pelvis exposed, uh -huh. specifically the, the pubic symphysis, where the, the two sides of the pelvis come together right at the hips. We've also got a couple ribs exposed and some other miscellaneous bones. Their methodology for digging out the mammoth fossils began with an excavator. Eventually, they had to do it the old-fashioned way, with a shovel and a trowel. 
Yeah, if everything you can see down to that level where you got a square wall, uh -huh. that was all taken out by that excavator right over there. Uh, okay. We did that on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And then by Sunday afternoon, we were actually in the in the units excavating. Yeah. 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 We came out beforehand and, you know, you want to make sure before you take out that much dirt that you're not actually digging through a later archaeological site. So, you know, this was laid down 13,000 years ago. There's always the potential that somebody came back you know, 4,000 years ago and had a campsite here. And so before we took an excavator to it, we put down a bunch of auger probes to make sure there was no artifacts. And there wasn't. It looks like there's nothing above this. So we were able to just take it straight down to this level and, you know, save us probably two weeks of time <laughs> digging wow. by doing that. Wow. By, you know, four hours of using the backhoe. Beginning out, we started with shovels because we know that the bone was a lot lower. So you kind of start out with some coarse grain techniques to get the site down. But then once you get around bone, you don't want to nick bone, you don't want to break it. So you start using things like trowels. And when you really get on bone, you use bamboo so that it doesn't actually scratch the bone uh, because the bamboo is softer than the bone surface. Um, so yeah, using pretty fine grain techniques. We're digging now in what we call quads, which are 50 by 50 centimeter squares and then five centimeter increments. So if we do find any artifacts, we want to be able to nail the locations of those artifacts down to a really tight area. And so about 50 by 50 by about that much is, you know, that's, that's good. That's pretty tight for the units. And you always use metric and not, not American, not US? Yeah, they used feet and inches until probably the you know, early 70s in Wyoming and then switched over to metric. So pretty much globally, archaeologists use the metric system at this point. And, and that's just to establish some, uh, a standard? It's also just easier. I mean, it's in tens, right? Everything's in... 10, 10 centimeters or increments of 10. So it's a lot easier to think about and conceptualize than using inches and feet when you're trying to do calculations off the top of your head. Their work is extremely detailed. For example, every few minutes, someone requests help taking measurements with the precise machine. I asked Spencer to explain how it works. 240. We call it EDM. Um, it basically finds angles and distance. It's like any kind of surveying instrument, uh, except this one's digital. When we set this thing up, all we really have to do is tell it is, is where it's facing. So when you set it up, you tell it, you know, this way is north, and it's this high, basically. So whenever you uh, rotate this thing on, on this axis, it knows which angle it's facing. And then by shooting a laser at this prism, and um, it, measuring the time it takes for that laser to bounce back, it knows its distance. So as long as you know angle, distance, and then it's got a it's got an internal level, so it knows which the angle this way as well. It can triangulate positions that way. So you can get uh, millimeter precision for any kind of measurement you take with it. So we're, we're digging in five centimeter levels. So all these numbers I'm giving them are for them to know if they're at the end of the five centimeter level yet. So they're all in five centimeter increments. So if I tell him 051, that means he's one millimeter off of the five centimeter level that he wants to go to. He wanted to go to an elevation of 95.050. Is it 051? Close enough. One millimeter is uh, nothing. I was beginning to realize why this painstaking millimeter by millimeter process takes such a long time. So this kind of work could take years. Could. In, just in one site, right? Yeah, the site that a lot of these folks excavated on earlier this summer, the Laprell Mammoth site. We opened that site up in 2014. Um, so this was year eight. There's a couple of years we skipped excavations out there, but yeah, it's, it takes a long time at, at times. Uh, this will probably take you know, this year plus at least next year. If we find any uh, archaeological evidence here, any evidence of people being here, it'll probably turn into a much longer project. So, and we want to find all the evidence for people interacting with the sound. 
Already we know that this project will take at least two years and that's not including the bone analysis and the documentation that goes with it. Keep in mind that a lot of these people are professors, students, state government workers, so they have a lot of things to do other than digging for bones. To top it off, many are parents with dogs. I'll say, luckily, this sediment is very soft and loose. It's easy to dig. Peels away from this bone. This bone's beautifully preserved, so we don't have to spend a lot of time consolidating the bone or casting it to get it out of the ground. It's just very well preserved, and it makes excavating a lot easier when it's like that. Uh, if this bone was, say, just heavily degraded and falling apart, for every one of these we expose, we'd have to put uh, archival glue on it. We might have to actually wrap it in a cast, like the cast that you get on your arm, to keep that bone together. And that's a super time-consuming process that really extends the duration of an excavation by you know, weeks, basically. This stuff's great, though. It's re really good shape mm -hmm. as far as 13,000-year-old bone goes. Digging out the bones is only the first step. They didn't want to miss even the smallest fragment. So, as they dig, they collect the dirt in buckets, dump it in grates to filter out sand, wash it, let it dry. Someone then searches for small bone fragments or other artifacts. Right now, I'm just uh, looking through this screen that um, we've, got, we've excavated some sediment uh, out of the, the unit next to the mammoth over there. And so I'm kind of picking through to look for any bones or potential artifacts if we find any. Um, yeah, and my role on the project, I'm just actually here as a volunteer. <laughs> I normally study Neanderthals and early modern humans over in Africa and Europe, but I'm interested in hunter-gatherers and um, all over the world. So come up here and get a, a bit of local archaeology in the, in the United States for a bit. <laughs> Great. So do you think you found anything uh, human-related? Well, we found some small potential flakes that would have come from like making maybe making a stone tool. Um, but we're not sure because a lot of them are in like the local ma raw material that you can find throughout the, the area here that's kind of eroding out of the, the natural deposits. So it's hard to tell if it's, we haven't found anything that's like definitely human made, so. Okay, and, um, how do you tell the difference between uh, naturally occurring flakes and, and human made flakes? Well, we can look for some, there's some telltale signs on flakes, like bulbs of percussion and nice platforms. But the problem is, is the ones we find are very, so far, are very, very tiny. And there's, they have some of those identifiable features, but they're not, you know, they're not home runs. So we want to find something that, um, yeah, if we find more or like a, a, a more modified uh, stone tool that might have you know, that's something that has had more flakes coming out of it or like a, a larger flake out of a material that's from far away. Uh, because if it's stuff that's just here locally, it, it could have, you know, it may have fractured from natural processes. But if it's a piece of material that came from, you know, many miles away, then it was moved here by humans. When they find large bones that are cracked or brittle, Researchers use a type of glue to stabilize the pieces so they don't fall apart when they finally pull them out of the ground. So you're trying to glue that together so it doesn't come apart? Yeah, we're trying to stabilize it a little bit so that if we end up maybe doing a cast on one side or something like that, it will be damaged. Then they get an accurate 3D model of the site. Today we're focusing on photography, three-dimensional photogrammetry modeling, and mapping so we've already got some of this mapped in a lot of detail we've got them all numbered individually the next step is to uh, pull the bone out and get some elevations underneath the bone where the bone is sitting 
wrap it up in bubble wrap and try to stabilize it best we can and just move through the bone bed trying to get all the stuff out of the ground. The goal is to be very precise and get the site in digital form. So they created 3D model using a combination of two techniques. One is to take hundreds of photographs, as you see Todd doing here, which are then stitched together with special software. The other thing they do is use a drone to record video photographs, which was for me entertaining to watch. The result is a precise 3D model that researchers can use to examine the placement and size of the bones. The last step is to either wrap them in plastic or aluminum foil or protect them with a thick layer of plaster to transport them to the lab. The bones are then stored in Todd's lab where they will be prodded and examined. When the research is complete, the bones will be sent to the University of Wyoming Archaeological Repository. After some initial examination, the research team found evidence of rodents chewing on the bones. They carbon dated the site to 13,100 to 13,200 before present, which is AD 1950. That would date them from between 11,250 to 11,150 BCE. What was your reaction when you first learned about this site? We were real excited. We uh, have some other fossil bones and a lot of the guys were always looking at that and the kids love it and we like showing it. And when uh, Gerardo, that was running the excavator, found uh, uh, the ball of the femur, um, we were we knew what we had and we were really excited to uh, get it, get some more identification. We don't know exactly where on the site it found, but uh, we knew we were going to get the University of Wyoming um, over here uh, later rather than sooner. So uh, we've really been excited to see what we have. What are your overall hopes of, of, of all of this? You know, we just, curiosity. We, uh, we hope it's a, uh, a kill site. We have a couple uh, artifacts that could possibly be uh, hooked to it as being a kill site. Which those are very rare in North America from what I understand now. Maybe only 15 or 16 of them in all of North America. So that's really an unusual thing. We'd like to, um, when we do the big excavation, get some people to, a lot of kids to come out and see it. It's really interesting for young people. I know I have a nephew that's a science teacher in Riverton and he's excited to bring he goes on field trips every year and it's going to be his field trip. So education of them and, and then uh, for the University of Wyoming. We love the University of Wyoming and we want them to be able to uh, uh, study it and learn what they can and, and further their, their education and, and discovery of these great things in Wyoming. In June of 2023, the team went back and finished the dig. As of July 4th, Todd sent me an email that said, I'm fairly confident that we have no evidence of humans at this site. It's just a mammoth that died naturally near the end of the last ice age. Still, it provides a useful comparison to sites where we know that there was human involvement. I want to thank Todd and the rest of his team for allowing me to record them at the dig site. It was an exciting experience for me because I got to satisfy one of my childhood fantasies, which was to dig up fossils. Now, even though I wasn't the one who dug up the bones, I was still able to watch people dig up these bones with my own eyes. And I stood in the middle of all of these bones. It was just very inspiring for me. And I hope you too can be inspired to seek out one of your fantasies or childhood dreams. Thank you for watching. I am Ramon Bannister, signing out.